Dr. Ben Bickman, you are the insulin guru. You know so much about that. That is your world of expertise. Can you tell me how does in insulin inhibit fat loss? Right. Yeah, the primary mechanism is a direct inhibition of lipolysis. So lipolysis is the term we use to refer to the breakdown of fat from the fat cell. Now, people will often say fat burning, but that's not fat burning. Fat burning is the end fate. That's what the fat is going to go and do after it comes out of the fat cell. So before we ever have fat burning or the oxidation, we have the breakdown or the lipolysis. Insulin has this choke hold on lipolysis. And if insulin levels start to climb, it will inhibit lipolysis no matter what other stimulus is present. So you can try to be stimulating lipolysis with catecholamines like adrenaline, for example. And if insulin is elevated over, even slightly over fasted levels, it immediately starts to depress that signal to the point that once you've gone a couple multiples over fasted levels, which is very easy to do with insulin, you've shut off lipolysis entirely. So largely the primary effect of insulin controlling weight loss is its effect on lipolysis. And again, to state that clearly, as insulin goes up, lipolysis drops, um, you, you shut it off. But as much as people don't acknowledge this, insulin absolutely influences the front end as well, which is the movement of fat, but it depends on the size of the fat cell. So while there's a lot of controversy and debate on insulin's ability or insulin's acting as a stimulus to pull the fat in to the fat cell, um, it depends on the size of the fat cell. Smaller fat cells, insulin does stimulate fatty acid uptake into the fat cell. So as much as it controls the back end of the fat cell by regulating lipolysis, it does in fact also influence the front end, particularly in smaller fat cells. And as the fat cell gets larger, that effect becomes you know, somewhat diminished. And now insulin isn't controlling fat uptake, but it's still controlling the the exit of it, so the, the the leaving of the fat or the lipolysis. So, in other, so with these two ideas combined, if someone can appreciate pretty quickly how insulin really does control the growth and the shrinking of the fat cell. For me, when I'm saying define, I actually mean like on the order of microns, like how many micrometers is its diameter. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a new one, although it certainly could. But some people genetically have the ability to make new fat cells. And in fact, some one of the sexes does in particular areas, but referencing some people first, a paper published decades ago found that in the average obese population, about 80 some percent of this mixed ethnicity population has gotten obese through hypertrophy. So the number of fat cells hasn't changed, but the size of the fat cells have. So that's the hypertrophy of the fat cell, which is particularly pathogenic. When a fat cell gets big or fat, then it becomes very insulin resistant and very pro-inflammatory. However, a small fat cell, and this is again a subset, let's say about 15% of people who can become obese or do become obese, they have this genetic ability to continue to make new fat cells. And so to kind of come back to your question, those would be younger fat cells. They haven't had time to get big, but they also don't have the metabolic pressure to get big because in that individual who genetically can continue to make fat cells, every time the fat cell starts to get a little bit of growth pressure on it, it recruits a new fat cell. And so no fat cell ever gets too big. And those are the people who paradoxically can both become fantastically obese and yet still and not become type 2 diabetic and insulin resistant. And these are the people that they make TV shows about. The fact is most people around the entire world could never get to 600 pounds. You and I very, very likely statistically, we could do everything we could tr to try to get to 600 pounds. And as the fat cells get bigger and bigger and bigger, they become more and more insulin resistant and thus become less sensitive to insulin signal attempting to tell them to continue to get big. And that's because the fat cell can reach about 20 times its normal dimensions, which is unlike any cell. There's no cell in the body that can grow 20 times its kind of native size. But as the fat cell begins to approach this maximum dimension, it starts to become resistant to insulin all in an effort to prevent itself from literally bursting like an overfilled water balloon. And so these people who genetically continue to make fat cells, they are getting fatter and fatter and fatter, but they still maintain their insulin sensitivity, which means they can continue to get fat as it's continue, continuing to get stored in small fat cells. 
Um, in fact, we see this even in clinical practice. One of the most effective anti-diabetic drugs, so a drug that would be prescribed to someone with type 2 diabetes, who almost always is going to be a little overweight, um, and there's very much an ethnic component to that, but even still, they may be prescribed a class of drug called a thiazolidine dione or a TZD. Um, these drugs will improve their insulin sensitivity very, very well, but paradoxically, because it makes them fatter, it actually stimulates their body's ability to make new fat cells. And so on one hand, they have this situation where they're getting fatter and fatter with every dose they're taking every month, and yet at the same time, their diabetes is getting better. It's because they're allowing the big hypertrophic fat cells to start sharing some of that burden wow. with the new fat cells. And so I'm such an advocate of the idea of people acknowledging this by stating it's not the mass of fat we have that matters most when it comes to insulin resistance, it's how you're storing your fat. Are you storing your fat in hypertrophic, fewer but fatter fat cells, or more abundant or hyperplastic, more abundant but smaller fat cells? And this is very much at the heart of why across the spectrum of ethnicities, why on one hand you have say a, a chinese ethnicity man who has among the lowest tolerances to store fat the chinese typically typically on average that body type has a very limited number of fat cells and so if that person is eating a diet where insulin is stimulated and to, to st stimulate the growth of the fat and there's sufficient calories to fuel that growth because you need both of them you can't have fat growth without both of those, then he has a very he has a very low threshold of fat gain. A little bit of fat on his body, he's just mildly chubby and he already is pre-diabetic, he has hypertension, he has fatty liver disease. On the far other end of the spectrum, you have the typical Caucasian kind of Northern European ethnicity, which is the most abundant ethnicity in the US, me and you included. That is an ethnicity, that's a body type that has a slightly higher potential to make new fat cells. And so that's a body type where he got just as fat as the Chinese, his Chinese buddy, and yet he's still fine. He just doesn't look as good in his Speedo as he used to. But he doesn't have any sign of fatty liver disease or any sign of prediabetes, but he's just as fat as his old Chinese college roommate was. That's the personal fat threshold idea, which, but again, it's not because a person reaches a particular mass of fat. It's that it's, you would basically ask the question, how full are your fat cells? And the moment those fat cells are full, now those fat cells become insulin resistant and they become pro-inflammatory to try to correct blood flow, which is a different issue. But the combination of those variables basically leads to that being the first domino to fall along this cascade and then the liver becomes insulin resistant, the muscle, et cetera.